Welcome to the Orthopedic Indications channel, where we discuss medical education for medical sales consultants and reps. Greetings, my name is Nick Strasser. This is Indications, and um, this is a platform that is really geared towards uh, those who work in surgery, particularly those who are in medical sales, and uh, getting some background and idea behind some of the techniques that we use for some of the various orthopedic surgery uh, cases that we do. So today I'm gonna to talk through tendon transfers. The premise of this was we did a combined conference uh, with Spine and PM&R about management of foot drop and best practices, et cetera. And so uh, this is kind of the, you know, what we talked about when it came to tendon transfer. So it's a little bit of background of what the tendon transfers look like. When are we considering it? What the things you need to think about from the pre-op workup? Uh, and then some of the technique uh, a part of this so that you kind of understand what we're, what we're thinking as you get into some of these cases. So the 2018 draft is pretty interesting to look at now, uh, what, six years later, as you look at some of the players uh, that have become you know, household names. Uh, you know, you certainly have Trey Young, you have DeAndre Ayton, you have Troy Brown Jr., Luka Doncic, obviously everyone knows, you know, he's made a big splash. Uh, but Michael Porter Jr. is kind of an interesting case to look back at because as it came out during his freshman season, he was really highly uh, touted as being a one, number one or number two draft pick. And it came out that he had a back injury and had a couple surgeries. And I don't know any of the specific, specific, specific details on his case, but ultimately it came out that you know, he was dealing with the foot drop. Uh, you started to see some images show up of him wearing a brace, etc. Uh, and so, you know, really interesting to think through how are you managing this patient in the situation of a foot drop? Because obviously they are very reliant on the tendon working and the muscle funk motor unit working in order to develop you know, such a uh, such an elite functional status. The uh, when you talk about foot drop in in the patient, uh, you have to think through the different causes. So obviously we're talking about spine and neurologic causes. Common perineal nerve is probably the one more common, particularly we'll see it in some of our um, knee dislocations, for example, very common to see a common perineal nerve injury uh, or crush injury. We'll see that situation develop. Uh, you want to look for things such as an anterior tibial tendon disruption because that can sometimes masquerade as a foot drop. And then there's obviously things such as compartment syndromes, uh, some of the neurologic causes uh, like leprosy, polio. You know, we don't see those as often, but occasionally they can show up. And certainly our, our history of tendon transfers is very rich uh, with these um, diagnoses. Um, our pre-op workup is going to be a physical exam, physical exam, physical exam. Uh, it certainly can be helpful to have, uh, we want our neurology and PM&R and spine team involved because they help uh, with a lot of the you know, surrounding circumstances. But, uh, and it is a team uh, effort in terms of managing these patients. We do get EMG and nerve conduction studies. I get, like to get a foot x-ray, a weight-bearing foot x-ray, really particularly looking for deformity, uh, quality of bone, et cetera. MRI may or may not be helpful. It might be helpful if you're concerned about like an anterior tibial tendon rupture. Um, and then, you know, you have to think through a little bit on the duration from the injury to, uh, or the inciting event from when you would proceed with a tendon transfer. So that's making a bunch of assumptions, kind of jumping to this idea of surgery, but um, there's different thoughts on it. If, when I came through training, it was you wait a year. Uh, now I think it's more accepted that it's reasonable to intervene sooner uh, as you can get those motor function units working sooner. Uh, maybe you have less atrophy over time. So maybe that's not fully um, parsed out in the literature, but I don't think it's, un I don't think you necessarily need to wait a full year uh, if you're, if things are just not responding uh, at three months or so. And then you need to make sure you manage expectations. Patients get better with a tendon transfer, but it's not a normal functional result. And you'll see that a little bit later in the sort of literature. They still may need a brace, so it's important to discuss with them uh, that this is
historically tendon transfers um, have a big place in orthopedic surgery. You know, you look about, you think about our grandfather of orthopedics, Sir Robert Jones, who described um, the Jones fracture. So his name comes up pretty frequently. He described a splint. But one of the things that he did, which was pretty cool, was he talked about uh, a lot of techniques, including some of the tendon transfers. And so this is some of the early iterations of tendon transfers from 1908. And it's interesting to look through this because a lot of these principles really apply to how we approach these. Um, the BOFAS group has a great talk and I borrowed this um, kind of basically the concept here from, from their talk and I'll link to it in the, in the video or in the comment section below. But they did a really great job of outlining some of the requirements for considering a tendon transfer. So this would be general principles in all of orthopedic surgery. You know, so one thing you have to make sure is they have flexible flexibility. They have mobile joints. You need to make sure um, that the soft tissue uh, allows for a transfer, meaning that if there's a bunch of scar tissue uh, from a crush or or a, a free flap or something of that nature, it can be difficult to get that tendon, even though it's working, and it, it can be get, difficult to get it to glide through the tissues. You have to make sure that the tendon has that the donor the tendon muscle unit has the ability to move back and forth that it can actually function. And these, I think these are some seem common sense, but it, you have to work through it. You have to make sure that it has good strength. So you want to make sure it's at least a four out of five strength. Now there's some debate, like in this case that we're talking about today, that if you transfer a posterior tib that doesn't really work that well, that you get some tenodesis effect, meaning it almost acts like, acts like a brace that's internally kind of implanted to hold that foot up. Um, so there's that consideration. You have to make sure that you don't need it for something else, that it's expand, expendable. Uh, you have to make sure that it is in the appropriate line of pull because if you know in, if you take a rope, for example, we'll use pulleys to go around corners. You can't do that necessarily in the human body. So you have to make sure that the tendon itself has direct line of pull. And that might be one of the downsides of the posterior tip tendon because you bring it through the interosseous membrane. So making sure that you have enough uh, excursion of the motor unit through that interosseous membrane, that it's not coming through just a little tiny poke hole uh, is important. Uh, that you have to make sure that it is synergistic. Again, maybe another problem with the posterior tib tendon is you're requiring it to pull it up. So there's some training that goes along with teaching that tendon unit to start to work. And then uh, it, you have to make sure that it, it's only doing one thing. If you ask it to do too many things, it's not going to do any of them well. So only one, uh, one function. and including transferring the posterior tib tendon into the dorsum of the foot. And at that point, it was like a single line of single line transfer. And then the bridle became more popularized um, kind of out of that same group, I would say, you know, that was out of Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. Um, and what they did is they modified things. And this was like in the 90s. So this is not that long ago. And they did this in pediatric patients. Most of them had actually CP, so a little different condition. But what they did was they took the posterior tib tendon, transferred it to two spots. You had the anterior tib and the perineus longus. And that uh, allowed for a little bit more even pull um, of because it, um, it gave a more balanced pull from both sides of the foot, as opposed to going to one point in the middle of the foot. So if you think about what was available at the time, you didn't have the buttons, you didn't have the interference screws uh, that was not as you know, ubiquitous as we have today. So getting purchase into the bone was actually a little bit more challenging. So in this situation, they're actually taking, take the tendon, 
attach it to the anterior tib and the perineus longus, and then do a tendon to tendon transfer, which certainly had some advantages at the time. It also helped with balancing the foot because you don't, you can't always evenly pull one side to the next. You think about your control, it's going to be a little bit better um, from the med you know, by grabbing both medially and laterally. In spastic patients, you could adjust tension accordingly if there was a deformity. Uh, it avoided bone tunnels and then it helped avoid the extensor retinaculum. So that was kind of the idea uh, behind the, the bridal procedure. And really it wasn't that long ago that that was really described. And now I think it's been modified that we take the tendon down into the interference, uh, in, through an interference uh, fit uh, bony tunnel of the either the middle or lateral cuneiform. And then we're still augmenting with the uh, perineus longus and the anterior tib. Uh, Dr. Johnson has a great video over on YouTube. Again, I'll provide a link to that as well that goes kind of step by step through the process uh, and I think has some really good technique um, tips to do. The uh, procedure itself involves multiple in surgery, uh, multiple incisions. So if you ever in a case like this, um, you will see multiple incisions. And, and it's worth mentioning that, you know, I, I mentioned having a mobile joints. And so a lot of times we're using a, uh, doing a tendon lengthening of the Achilles, and that could be a gastroc recession or strayer, could be a, a TAL, depending on what is needed and what the patient presents as. We'll make an incision first down in the medial aspect of the foot will identify the posterior tib. You've got to make sure that you're getting as distal as possible because sometimes that length to get to the top of the foot and get it inter uh, fixed is a little bit, um, you're kind of stretching things, I guess. So make sure you get that as distal as possible and get that tagged. And you can see here they taper it down really nicely. And then you have a second incision for delivery of the post tib uh, in the, with the green arrow here. So that's where we bring it up. So we tag it here in this picture, we come more proximal on the medial side. We identify the tendon uh, posterior medial, and then we make another incision. They, uh, if you look at the third incision, we're gonna release the perineus longus or brevis, depending on what you need. Typically it's gonna be, uh, I'll typically take the longest and I try to make it at the same level as my fifth incision over the anterior compartment, which you see in the yellow arrow there, so that I know that that perineus longus can get all the way up there. And then the fourth incision uh, is down on the foot and that's where we're bringing perineus longus back down to. I loop it through the perineus brevis to give some pull onto the outside part of the foot. And then that entire construct gets sewn together in the kind of that, that incision that I showed on the front of the leg, which you can see here. And so the, the way that I think is that the best way to do this is to really leave the um, posterior tib tendon intact. So don't cut it at all. And then split anterior tib, split perineus longus and pull the posterior tib through that. And that way, your less risk of that posterior tib tendon being disrupted. So you can see that happening in this case here. We split everything together and then we can uh, tension everything kind of at the end, again, to help control for some balance. We'll typically fix the posterior tib through a interference screw. And that's usually where I start. I'll fix it there into that, into the middle part of the foot with an interference screw. There's certainly other uh, techniques where you actually have a button plus an interference screw. And I think that's really nice because then you back everything up and uh, you get that securely fixed. You get to about five to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion and that's where an Achilles lengthening can be super helpful. And then we'll, um, at the end of everything, I'll suture together up in that middle part that they're showing there with the retractors, we'll suture all that together at the completion of everything. And then that's when you can kind of dial in your inversion, eversion. This is what it looks like on the, um, you know, Dr. Johnson probably has the biggest case series uh, outside of the initial bridal. This was at 19 patients with a bridal. This is for foot drop and really describing, you know, pretty good improvement in their in their activity. So they were able to improve their ADLs and their sports and, and things like that, but they don't get to be as good as like a control group, you know? So it, that's why you have to kind of counsel them. Hey, we can make it better. Hopefully we can get rid of the brace, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, and same thing in this systematic review, this is of 37, uh, 37 studies and majority of patients are either satisfied or you're very satisfied or satisfied. You've got one out of 10 still use uh, an AFO for some activity. So I think that's about the numbers that you can quote after that. And you certainly see um, that 
uh, there's near full restoration of motor function for their swing phase, which is what we're really trying to accomplish. There is going to be some loss of plantar flexion strength, which makes sense because we're harvesting posterior tibs. So you can see where uh, things uh, get used and where some of the loss is going to be. So in that push off, push off strength. So that's on a kinematic uh, uh, analysis of bridal, patients with the bridal. In terms of the timing, it's not necessarily clear. Traditionally, I was taught 12 to 18 months. Uh, there's certainly been some studies that have supported earlier intervention. You know, this particular uh, paper here talked about functional uh, evaluation of early tendon transfer and kind of the idea that, um, it, that if you carry that out earlier, it may help as a, act as a helper or as an internal splint or a substitute to help with the rehabilitative phase of things. So I think that that's something worth mentioning that if you get to three months, that's at least my approach. If I get to three months and they're not showing any signs of improvement, I'll at least have a conversation about tendon transfer. And if they, a lot of times they'll wait a little bit longer, but at six months, if it's not getting much better and you have some nerve, you know, EMG nerve conduction studies that would indicate that it's not improving much, then I think going ahead with the tendon transfer is, is very reasonable at that point, especially if you're not seeing much in the change, in the way of change. And then finally, you know, you look at how Michael Porter Jr. is doing, because it's kind of fun to go back and look now. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting to note is if you look at this close up here, what do you notice? You notice that he's wearing a brace. And so I, I say that not because, you know, tendon transfers are bad. I think they can be definitely helpful. But, you know, in this case, to my knowledge, he hasn't undergone a tendon transfer. He still wears a brace and he's performing at an extremely high level. So my point with this is saying, don't neglect the power of a well-fitting brace because it can be really helpful in improving function um, and can really serve as a tool to be able to kind of get you back to a lot of those activities. So I think certainly something to consider uh, when it comes to, you know, how you want to manage this, uh, in the future. So that's my, that's my talk on tendon transfers. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like, and this is helpful, please subscribe below. Uh, we'd love to all your support. And if there's content that you want to see us uh, touch on, uh, feel free to reach out. Take care.